graduate students, right? Uh, this course is, uh, well, graduate slash upper undergraduate. And I don't know exactly how much of the quantum mechanics you know. Uh, my previous experience with uh, graduate students from different universities in Canada is that they usually take in chemistry departments for well, maybe one, one and a half courses of quantum mechanics, uh, maybe two at most. At downtown, uh, they take three courses. That's the biggest number I've seen anywhere. And uh, uh, I guess if you taken all three of those classes, probably there would be 50% overlap with whatever I'm uh, gonna say, right? So, um, but if you are, well, from General Canadian University, then I assume you have a knowledge of uh, some basic uh, quantum mechanics like particle in the box, all the model problems, uh, some of them, well, only particle in the box usually is given with solutions, uh, full solutions from the beginning till the end and the harmonic oscillator, the solutions are just stated. Then hydrogen atom uh, solutions again are just stated. And then what else? Uh, so they also maybe talk about molecular orbitals, Born-Oppenheimer approximation, but again, they mostly state things rather than uh, kind of show them from first principles. Uh, that's my experience, correct me if I'm wrong. Then in this course, uh, which is upper undergraduate for both actually physics students and chemistry students, uh, we well, teach more quantum mechanics from the physical perspective, which means we'll make things simpler, but do them kind of ab initio or from first principles, okay? And uh, I think that will be, be it will be beneficial for the graduate students as well. Um, so you will see the exact formalism. We won't go much into the details of the I guess, solution of model systems again. So harmonic oscillator, hydrogen atom, uh, hydrogen atom yes. Uh, they will, uh, yeah, if you're interested, you could uh, just study solutions on your own. Uh, so, but we will look at uh, approximate methods uh, and uh, perturbation theory, variational approach in time-dependent, time-independent context, general formalism. And then we will move on to molecules, interaction with uh, light, okay? And uh, at the end, maybe we will uh, touch upon the symmetry more with mathematical details uh, or some more advanced topics, okay? So the lecturing will be the same uh, for graduate students and undergraduates, uh, the requirements will be different. Uh, for you, more emphasis will be put uh, grade-wise on uh, homeworks and uh, final presentations. So I hope you will be able to make presentations on some of these uh, last topics, right? And undergraduate students will benefit from that. And uh, you will benefit from that learning uh, more. Usually, I found that uh, Whoever presents actually learns the most, <laughs> simply because uh, you, well, it's usually hard to well, project 100% of your knowledge, right? So something will be still left, and uh, yeah, you you will be probably learning the most uh, by preparing. Okay, but, uh, that's the plan. So you all saw syllabus, and. Uh, to avoid such expensive commute, I guess you could just take TTC next time, right? So it only takes maybe one hour. Now from downtown, I would say it's one hour, right? So uh, yeah, it's not more than that uh, because half an hour on the subway, maybe even less, and then half an hour on the bus. So it's all quite straightforward. Uh, yeah, if you need more instructions, I will give you after the lecture, right? Uh, so what we started looking at uh, is basic formalism, essentially. And uh, you've seen some of the, like, I hope all of you have access now to um, lectures online, right? So I try to make all well, my, I guess, my philosophy general is that quantum mechanics is hard to really understand. You just use it, and uh, by using it, you understand how to well, to apply it to the problems of your interest, right? It works, that's why it's useful, and uh, it's quite counterintuitive and probably will never be completely intuitive because uh, well, the, 
the world around us is not quantum, okay? Most of the time. So there is, uh, now some people say there is no hope. You understand ever, right? But uh, there are different levels of understanding. So uh, for me, uh, the most important part so that uh, it uh, should be consistent, uh, the knowledge, and uh, so that you can apply it to problems of your interest, okay? So that's why even in the, well, looking at some of the conceptual things, trying to uh, emphasize the applicational part with useful e expressions and useful equations. So <coughs> just uh, we finished, uh, I guess, uh, talking about Schrodinger equation, some of the uncertainty principle, com like, you know, general formalism that uh, operators, uh, that's the way to get to the quantities uh, of properties of your interest and uh, in uh, quantum mechanics we have uh, two basic equations, time independent, time dependent Schrodinger equation, right? And uh, I would like to always emphasize the difference between those two. Um, and uh, well, they are different both mathematically and uh, conceptually. So uh, this, is, uh, this is somewhat less fundamental equation because not always we can formulate time independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, just to keep this more interactive, uh, can you tell me the conditions uh, when time independent equation cannot be formulated? When the potential energy is a function of time. That's right. I didn't so. Get a okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So Hamiltonian consists of two parts, right? Kinetic and potential, and potential uh, part has a choice to be either. Well, depending on the system you're considering, be either only space dependent or time dependent as well. And so when it's time dependent, then the time independent Schrodinger equation cannot be formulated, right? And this is time dependent Schrodinger equation. So what is the practical example when we need to uh, deal with the case where potential is time dependent? Can you give me some examples, just to make it concrete? Okay, maybe a simpler question. When the, the potential is time independent? What would be an example? What would be an example of the time independent potential? Uh, hydrogen atom? That's right. Particle in a box. I was, yeah. I was hoping that someone will say half particle in a box. Huh? Spherical box, yes. Uh, molecules, actually. That's the main example for chemists. Uh, so molecules, we have uh, electrons and nuclei, right? And the total Hamiltonian for molecules, although it contains many terms, we'll go into the details uh, later in this course. Kinetic energy of electrons, kinetic energy of nuclei, potential of electron, electron, potential of nuclear, nuclear plus electron-nuclear interaction, right? Uh, but all these terms, uh, they, well, kinetic energy terms, uh, they have uh, derivatives, second derivatives of various particles, uh, right? And the uh, potential, they are mostly, for the molecule, it's a Coulomb interaction between charged particles, right? So they have form like this. There is no time. And that's why uh, for molecules and for other particles as well, uh, generally, there is no time dependence. Okay, so the way now to bring time dependence into the picture is um, what? Any example? Time dependent potential. Yeah. Uh, that's right. If you consider radioactive phenomena, uh, it will well, require, or it can be considered as a time-dependent phenomena. Uh, well, phenomena itself time-dependent, but the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian actually is not time-dependent because uh, what happens in radioactive uh, decay 
if we again look at the very simplified model, right? So then the potential looks like this, right? And uh, it's not bound potential, right? But the barrier and the thickness and the height is pretty large. So if you put your system in the state at zero time, which is uh, somewhat localized in this comfortable well, right? Then at later time, eventually it will leak out, right? Because because um, do, you, do you know the reason why that's going to happen? Although there is there's a potential no time dependence, right? But the trouble is that your psi x zero, if you write this, for example. It's not, it's not an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, okay? So that's what is happening here, is that your metastable atom, right? It's not actually in the state of uh, total Hamiltonian, okay? It can be, well, probably, uh, if you modify the problem, create H0 problem that is like your original problem, but the potential is now bound, like say parabola, instead of uh, being you know, something exponentially decaying, okay? So then your function, localized function, this looks like a harmonic oscillator ground state function, right? It can be an eigenfunction of that guy, and if our system would be harmonic oscillator, then this is an eigenstate, will stay there forever, nothing will actually change. Uh, the, the psi xt would still have time dependence, by definition it should have time dependence, but it would be trivial time dependence, uh, which just comes out of a, a condition that uh, oh, this function must be uh, also solution for the Modified time dependent Schrodinger equation. So if your initial state happens to be an eigen function, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it, yeah. then you're staying that state forever. But if it's not, you need to make a linear combination out of the eigen states, and then you end up having time dependent some sort of process, mm. or however you want to do this. Is that? That is correct, yes. That, that's where I'm going with this. And uh, yeah, you essentially stated this. The only kind of correction here would be, st mathematically speaking, even in eigenfunction state, we have time dependence. It's trivial. When, when you calculate expectation values. When you calculate expectation values, it kind of uh, will go away, right? Yeah. Unless, your, unless your operator is time dependent and may act on, the, on that part. But uh, generally, for time independent operators, Keep things simple. These states, they generate time independent probability density. That's why they're called stationary states if they're eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, right? And Hamiltonian doesn't depend on time. Now, in this case, uh, for the true potential, which is exponentially decaying, the localized function will never be an eigenstate of the problem, okay? So the true eigenstates of the problem they are, well, continue, uh, essentially, they form continuous spectrum, and they always have these tails that go forever, right? So they are more like uh, plane wave functions. Uh, you know that if you formulate the problem, say, if with just kinetic energy, right? So then uh, your kinetic energy, say, minus i h bar squared divided by 2m, right? And square. So it's very easy to solve this equation. Uh, it's just a second order. And then you will get this plane wave functions uh, that will be eigenfunctions of the system. Okay? And of course, uh, this imaginary exponent, I hope uh, well, everyone is fine with imaginary numbers, right? I assume. Okay, so this is well, based on the Taylor, uh, sorry, not Taylor, but the Euler um, 
equation that can be represented as cosine pi x plus i sine pi x. All right. So cosine and sine, they go forever from minus infinity in x to plus infinity in x, right? So for this potential, of course, we will have some boundary conditions here. If the potential goes like this, then it's probably exponential decay here. But after the potential, we will have uh, infinite oscillations in the, in the eigenstates of the problem. So no matter uh, what function you build here, doesn't really matter how it looks. Well, it shouldn't be <laughs> uh, double valued, but uh, can be anything. As long as it's localized, that means in order to represent it, you'll need infinite number of these functions. Because uh, why infinite? Uh, well, simply because you would want to um, remove all these tails, right? And for that, you would need to cancel them uh, by summing with some coefficients to build up this structure and remove everything uh, outside of the, the domain where your function is local, right? So that's why whatever function, localized function you have, it's not going to be eigenfunction. And then it will just uh, evolve uh, because the evolution is uh, simply following from the fact that, OK, say if your psi x0 is a linear combination now of uh, true functions of the system, right? Then, if you put this into Schrodinger equation, well, then you can generate the true solution for a later time. And the solution will be Do you know why this is going to be a solution? OK, so it's one of, like time dependent, time independent Schrodinger equations. It's one of these uh, problems where if someone gives you a solution, it's actually quite simple to check, right? The differential equations are all, all like that. If someone gives you a solution, it's a matter of seconds to check that it is a solution. But to find a solution, it's much harder problem. Mm -hmm. So, but. Here or not, for this problem, uh, it's actually both ways are quite easy. Uh, first, to check that this is a solution, all you need for the any differential equation, you just put psi in this form into the left and right-hand side, right? So uh, the left-hand side, what it will generate, uh, it will, uh, h will act. h is a linear operator, so it will keep acting on the each term, right? And what it will generate is, uh, well, say, left, uh, left hand side will be um, sum over Cn energies phi n exponent minus i e n t h, right? So all the Hamiltonian will do is to uh, will generate this constant, right, in front of the functions. Okay? Uh, according to well, according to our logic that uh, now we're writing our localized wave packet or well, linear combination is a linear combination of uh, eigenstates for the true Hamiltonian, right? So then this is left-hand side. And then the right-hand side will be, uh, we just need to differentiate. And uh, here I will probably skip from now on the h bar h bar will be 1, and that's, uh, at that's atomic units, uh, right? Just to avoid uh, extra uh, writing of n unnecessary things. Uh, so the atomic units are the most convenient for uh, well, doing quantum mechanics, uh, not to carry extra constants. Uh, so the right-hand side is just uh, then i, and then di differentiation of this expression is quite simple. You just differentiate the exponents, right? And then you get uh, Cn phi n x, and then minus uh, En, uh, yeah, we'll forget about h bar. Okay, and then 
the, the exponents will, will stay there. Exponents, ah, I keep writing it. Um, exponents are functions uh, which you cannot well, kill by differentiation, right? And so what happens here is minus i and i will give you 1, right? Because minus i times i, this twice gives you minus 1, another minus is 1. So that means that the right-hand side really is equal to cn phi nx, en, and then the exponent. Right? So then the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side. Right? So that's a solution. Okay? Now you may wonder why. Well, so it is a solution. Good. Now, it has a time dependence, and then you might kind of wonder, all right, so this guy also had a time dependence, but we said that it's, it's going to be stationary, right? Why having several terms here make things truly dynamic, right? And uh, one simple way to see it is just you, you look at this quantity, uh, which is measurable now, this uh, probability density, right? And so for case where you have, well, instead of working with this infinite sums, which potentially can be here, let's just consider two terms, right? So if you do C1 by 1 exponent minus EM1 T, right, plus C2 phi 2 2 T, right? And then you do square of that. Then, um, Compared to the previous case, what we will get is uh, we'll get time independent terms, which will be there C2 by 2. Because the exponents, uh, whenever we make an absolute square of this term and that term with itself, then the exponents uh, they, they get the conjugated, and uh, plus and minus i kind of will kill each other. And then you have these time independent terms which are analogs of time independent term. Like if you had just one term, then that would be it, right? Uh, but now, because of the two, t uh, two types of terms, there will be cross terms uh, that uh, will produce C1, C2, one with star, uh, phi1, phi2, star. And here there will be E phi1 with the star, so then E1 minus E2 t plus complex conjugated term where the stars will be on the second quantities. Okay, So these terms clearly time dependent and they will generate oscillations uh, of this quantity. Okay, And it's really easy to well, just do it at home. Take a particle in the box functions. Okay, Phi 1 and phi 2. I'll say phi and right, take a particle in the box functions by uh, n x divided by L, right? Responding energies. Then you can pick C1, C2, anything. And uh, then you will see if you plot psi 2, oh, sorry, psi absolute square, that uh, the picture will be uh, if you sum, say, first two particle in the box functions, right? So together here, they will be in the left-hand side. There will be constructive interference, and here will be destructive. So the psi squared will look like something like this, right? And then you will, if you will change the time at which you're looking at this quantity, that uh, kind of wave packet will be moving back and forth in the box, kind of uh, slashing back and forth. And uh, that's, that's essentially the manifestation of the fact that you are not working with the eigenstate, but rather with the superposition. And with this problem, it's a little bit harder because, well, it's harder to generate the eigenstates properly, but still possible. On the other hand, if the barrier is too thick and too high, then as we know with the radioactive elements, it may take years for them to decay, right? So really the tunneling process through that barrier may take uh, quite a long time. Okay. 
Uh, so this is not quite an example of. Um, we started with ask. I started with asking what what is the what would be example of the potential that is both uh, space and time dependent, right? So going back to that question, <laughs> what would be the potential that is space and time dependent? Like, come on, the the, the time dependent phenomena they are all around us. It's life, right? So what do we need to have life on Earth? <laughs> huh? Chemical reaction, but uh, what else? Think bigger. <laughs> yeah, close. Uh, what, what? Sun, right? Sun, sun. What is sun? A big ball of pollution. That's right, but when it gets to us, it's light, right? Uh, yeah. And what is light? Electromagnetic field, right? Yeah. So, analog of sun in the uh, kind of lab experiments would be lasers, right? And so whenever you have laser or electromagnetic field of it, well, it could be of various kinds, but the most of them are uh, time dependent when it's wave, right? So it's uh, just a potential made by the machine, like they have some kind of varying electromagnetic field? That's right, yeah. So if you have charges somewhere moving, uh, then it generates in the other parts of the space uh, time dependent but, uh, electromagnetic field. And uh, that electromagnetic field results in V of x t, right? So that that potential uh, makes it uh, well makes this equation is a fundamental equation where now Hamiltonian of the system will depend on time, and uh, strictly speaking, if your potential is time dependent, then this equation makes no more sense because uh, these guys are x dependent. Right, these are constant, and here you have both x and t. Here you don't have x and t. Uh, so that uh, I've never seen, like other than the introductions, like the yeah. very loose introductions yeah. of quantum mechanics, I've never seen a quantum mechanical treatment of light. I've like, never seen a wave function for a photon or something like that. What would that like? like can you use the Schrodinger equation for photons? I know it's supposed to work for bosons and fermions, but I <laughs> okay, there. Uh, Strictly speaking, again, since the photons are, well, they're traveling with the speed of light, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or they can potentially travel with the speed of light. Uh, then, when you get to the speed of light, you need to have uh, Lorentz invariance, right? Oh, so you need to use like a, a relativistic. That's right. So Lorentz invariance is essentially the transformation that should uh, well, leave equations uh, the same, right? When you transform the x and t according to the Lorentz transformation, yeah. well, Schrodinger equation is not Lorentz uh, invariant, mm -hmm. so everything will break down, and uh, oh, well, you you will not get the correct results. Uh, okay. So potentially, if you want to be complete, you want to go to Dirac equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are yeah. We yeah, it's a diff it's a diff it's not a quantum mechanics; it's quantum electrodynamics, and uh, yeah, so it's it's different. And uh, since well, many people in this audience are interested in molecules and uh, well, non-relativistic speeds, uh, then there are lots of problems already in quantum mechanics when you go to many particles. So many particle, many body physics. It's more, I guess, in of interest uh, at least to me, and uh, and I. Myself, of course, I can lecture on the Dirac equation, but uh, I, I don't work on that, right? So, okay. yeah. So, and plus the for molecules, uh, we can use uh, classical treatment of uh, light. Uh, second of all, it's uh, it's also possible to use uh, quantum treatment of light, right? Uh, but without going to the relativistic uh, domain, okay? okay. So the light then would be system of harmonic oscillators uh, that is quantized light, and you can you can represent the light quantization, and then work with that as a, some kind of reservoir or some extra degrees of freedom that are coupled to say molecular degrees of freedom, and then you can study the transfer between those uh, even without going to the relativistic uh, okay. you know, domain, right? So that's another uh, approach. 
And that becomes important when light uh, appears in the molecules. Like uh, what we will be looking at, uh, say light comes and uh, promotes the transition between electronic states. And I'll explain in a moment why this picture, why the states that are coming from time independent equation are still meaningful, right? Because it seems like I said that whenever we have light, then time independent Schrodinger equation uh, becomes meaningless, right? No, it's not the case. Uh, uh, there are situations where we can benefit from it. But then when you have an excited state, uh, we know that there are such things as fluorescence, for example, when the excited molecule can produce light. And then in, in this case, we cannot treat light anymore like a, just an external potential because to describe the process of photon emission when the system goes say from the excited state to the ground state uh, you need to have variables of light that could you know, essentially or wave function of light that could change right so uh, go into that analogy of uh, light being present, uh, presented as a system of harmonic oscillators Right, so you need to be able to excite this system, mm -hmm. and that would correspond to the uh, kind of generating the photons, and that requires quantum uh, consideration of light. Uh, okay, now why still for molecules uh, this is meaningful? Uh, because for what what we can do potentially for molecules is that our total Hamiltonian is. Uh, Hamiltonian of the molecule, let's say Hm, right, and it's time independent plus uh, potential that comes from light, right, to some electromagnetic field, right, and uh, it uh, interacts. So the total Hamiltonian it, uh, well, consists of two parts time independent and time dependent, okay? And it turns out that the energy of uh, electrons, say, in the molecule, uh, it's much uh, higher than the energy that uh, light brings, or the usual light, at least. And so we can say that molecular energy scale is higher, much higher, than the light energy scale. And for these cases, we can use so-called perturbation theory. We'll talk about this once we finish reviewing the formalism. And that perturbation theory, time-dependent version, will allow us to use time-independent uh, Schrodinger equation to obtain, say, states of molecule and treat this term in the total Hamiltonian to solve time-dependent Schrodinger equation uh, using the perturbative methods, assuming that this correction is small and uh, then we in this case, we, what we can do, we can uh, approximate the total psi xt as uh, some, this is the, some series of uh, wave functions. This, for example, comes uh, as in the case where we didn't have light, right? And then there will be correction to that, first order, second order, and so on and so forth. Uh, Essentially, this first order correction is the first non-trivial correction where you can see that uh, if light comes, you start it with a wave function in the ground state, then uh, you will have, after accounting for the interaction with light, some portion of the excited state here. Okay, so that's the kind of general plan. All right, all right, all right. Now. Just to, I guess, finish this uh, relation between time-dependent, time-independent Schrodinger equation, uh, we stated here that this is easy to check that uh, what I derived is a solution for time-dependent Schrodinger equation. If our Hamiltonian is time-independent, then we can quickly build the time-dependent uh, function like this. 
Now, where does this follow from, right? So how, if I didn't state this solution, uh, how would you guess that that's going to be a solution, okay? And there is an easy way to derive this. For that, all you need is to realize that there are some simplifications in the uh, eigenvalue problem for the case where your h is just time independent, right? Then, if we go back to the our fundamental time dependent Schrodinger equation, yeah, I promise not to write the h bar. Right, so. That's the setup, and uh, the question, and also the setup, I guess the part of the setup that we know that uh, uh, since it's time independent, we know the solutions for this problem, right? Now the question is how do we obtain the general psi xt in this case? Yeah. So how do we obtain psi? Or why this form? Where does it come from? Okay. Easy thing to realize is that if you move now time uh, derivative to the left, what you will get is the following equation. All right. Now, what is this? Uh, this is. Uh, equation of the type where you have h depending on x plus t operator depending on time and then they are acting on a function and we're getting zero and we can multiply zero by anything maybe except infinity right otherwise it will be confusing but uh, these functions, they are uh, well, they always finite, uh, right? And then this should tell us already that we can consider psi xt as an uh, eigenfunction for this operator, right? With the eigenvalue zero, okay? Now, the nice thing about this operator is that it's so-called separable operator. It has x part, it has t part, and has uh, no... Uh, part that would contain both x and t, right? So we, we said that our Hamiltonian is just x dependent. Now, if we had time dependence and potential, that whole thing would be broken, right? So we would not have uh, a separable operator. But now having separability for this case where h is x dependent is very nice. Uh, because uh, one thing, do, do you know what the eigen uh, functions will be for the separable operator? If you know, say, eigenfunctions of this guy, and if you know, let's assume you know eigenfunctions of this guy, what will be the eigenfunctions for the sum of two? Okay, this this is a, will be a kind of somewhat a recurrent theme uh, in in this course, or at least we will. Uh, I will re-emphasize this point when we go to the molecules, when we will try to separate electrons from nuclei, that will be also important. Uh, but right now, I can state the result. So imagine you have this, and now I will tell you in a, in a moment what these guys are. You will find them myself. Um, say, well, let's say theta and chi n t, right? So say you know eigenfunctions and eigenvalues for both operators, the question is, what is the eigenfunction for uh, some of them? And it's very easy to check that any combination of phi n, function of x, multiplied by chi m, function of t, will be an eigenfunction for this guy. It's very easy to check. Uh, the check is the following. So you have h plus t, right? It's acting on the phi n chi m, right? And uh, h doesn't act on chi, 
H only acts on phi, T acts only on uh, chi, but not acting on phi, right? And then you get uh, En product plus you get uh, theta M product. Okay, so you can combine functions and separate constants. And what you get is theta m uh, chi m phi n, right? So that means you act with the operator on the product, you get back your product and the constant in front. So that's by definition makes this product an eigenfunction of the operator, right? Okay, so it's very simple. So whenever you have uh, operators of two variables, this is your lucky day because uh, then you can solve one problem and then another problem and then combine them together to get the, uh, the solution of the total problem. That's a very easy case. Everyone wants that. In many body cases, uh, well, sorry, physics, in many body uh, systems like molecules, if you could formulate your Hamiltonian as a sum of Hamiltonians for electrons for the nuclei and there would be no interaction in between, then the molecules would be just a piece of cake, really. But there is a Coulomb interaction that makes every electron interact with every nuclei and also electrons interact with electrons and nuclei with nuclei, so it becomes a mess, right? And not that easy. But in this case, when your Hamiltonian at least doesn't depend on time, you can, you can do this, but there is one condition that this eigen uh, value for case of our interest, it must be zero, right? So that means that we are not interested in all possible pairs. We are interested in some pairs where En equals to minus theta m, right? So that they would compensate each other. All right, so then since we have a uh, well, system of eigenfunctions uh, in both, uh, for both operators uh, and they are connected, it turns out that the easiest way to proceed would be instead of solving for H part, uh, solve for T part because the T is just a one variable, D over DT uh, with I in front acting on the chi say uh, you use M, doesn't really matter which one you use. So you have this and then at the end you have theta M chi M T, right? So that's the equation for the T operator. That's the one I wrote that I will, uh, yeah, and I promise I will tell you what the eigenfunctions are. Indeed, just by separating variables, you can put, uh, well, how we did in the, First order, it's essentially first order kinetics just with the uh, extra I constant, right? So in first order kinetics, what you do, you separate variables, write it like this, equals two, I goes to that side, theta M divided by I, DT, and then you integrate, right? This gives you logarithm of chi M and um, this will be that, uh, well, say minus i theta m t, right? And uh, when you remove the logarithm, t equals to zero time times minus i theta m t, okay? So, you're getting this eigenfunctions as just simple exponents with minus i theta m. Now theta m should be equal to minus e n, right? And uh, there is an extra minus uh, here. Let's just be careful with the sign. So my t operator was actually minus i, right? So that means uh, that we have minus here really, and uh, plus here, minus here, plus here, right? And uh, 
now, now, uh, our, yeah. Well, when when I when I move i to the right hand side, uh, it was divided by i. That means it multiply. When you multiply by i, you get in minus one sign. But then there was one minus that uh, was forgotten uh, because t is not just derivative of the time, but rather minus derivative of the time, right? So everything so far okay here. And then then what you do is. Uh, you realize that, okay, it doesn't really matter how you uh, enumerate these functions, uh, but what happens is that theta m must be corresponding to the e n with minus sign, right? So that's the condition to to get the zero eigenvalue at the end, right? And uh, then we can take any pairs like this, where chi m is given by this expression. This is some constant uh, which defines initial conditions. Exponent of minus uh, i e n t multiply by phi n, right? So things start to shape up uh, because you see it's already have, we already have this component. Now, where did we get the sum? Well, the sum comes from the fact that now you can use superposition principle and take any number of combinations like this because they all will have eigenvalue, which is zero. So no matter how many you have, uh, they all will satisfy the condition that if you, well, that when h plus t will act on them, they will all be, well, essentially producing zero, right? So then let's just rename this guy as a coefficient, cn, corresponding to the function phi n. And then we'll sum all of them, right? Because uh, this is the most general form. Uh, let's start with cn, then phi n, x, the exponent minus i, e n, t. Right, so this is the most general solution. And if you give me CNs, then I'll give you what your wave function will be at later time. Okay? Important point here is that if your Hamiltonian is time independent, then knowing this part essentially will uh, directly lead you to the solution of uh, full time dependent equation. Right? So that's why a lot of struggle uh, is on the solving the time independent Schrodinger equation for molecules, for example. Their Hamiltonian is time independent. So if you can provide the eigenstates and eigenvalues uh, for the molecular states, then, then you can solve the full dynamics uh, if you don't have perturbations that depend on time. Okay? Now, if you have light, that's a different story. Then you use perturbation theory to still use this because you struggle a lot to get that in for the molecules, right? So you want to use that whole, you know, get the whole mileage out of it, right? So, and that's what perturbation theory allows you to do. But if you don't have complications with time-dependent potential, this is already enough to generate the solution uh, for the time-dependent on your equation, okay? All right, so let's do, I guess, uh, Two, three minute break, and uh, we'll continue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's great to finally meet the person. Okay. So now in quantum mechanics, we have uh, operators and functions, and functions live in the uh, uh, functional space, Hilbert space, uh, which is a linear but infinite dimensional space. We talked a little bit about it in the uh, first lecture. So you guys are familiar with linear spaces, right? So they have like generalized vectors, which are functions, and uh, in the Hilbert space case. And then you can sum them, uh, multiply them by a constant, uh, and also there is a scalar product or dot product that is introduced so that you can get numbers out of them, right? 
so or uh, estimate how large the function is uh, or how much is the overlap of two functions. The same operations like with vectors. Now, <coughs> the, a lot of uh, approximate methods uh, use well, various representations of operators because uh, as we spoke, uh, this problem of essentially time-independent Schrodinger equation is eigenvalue problem. And uh, in order to solve it, uh, one straightforward way would be to present phi n as uh, some kind of linear combination of uh, uh, some basis functions. And uh, let me call them. Um, right, and so these uh, basis functions uh, they c then later can be first we do not define what the coefficients are, uh, and then what we can do we just uh, expand uh, the our trial solutions, right? And these basis functions. combination and then <coughs> what helps here is if we multiply from the left by this uh, operator that uh, multiplies by some function out of the, our basis set so we have a basis set and uh, generally, this basis set is uh, orthonormal. That means say minus infinity plus infinity. Right? And you're all familiar with the Kronecker delta symbol, right? Okay. So we have that basis set. Now we multiply from the left. Uh, I switch kind of between the two ways of writing integrals. So physicists prefer to write integral dx and then whatever you need to integrate, right? You know, I don't know chemistry uh, literature well, doesn't use integrals so much. So <laughs> 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 but <laughs> generally, they prefer this way where you put the integral stuff. But uh, I'll be switching uh, depending on convenience. It's all the same. Uh, OK, so then you do this, uh, and then uh, essentially that's called projection. Because what we do, we would project on, the, on our basis functions, and uh, we'll get some uh, advantages of doing that. Because then the Hamiltonian is generally, well, as, a, as other operators that we work in quantum mechanics, it's uh, linear Hermitian operator and then it will act on each of the basis functions right separately and uh, then we will see how it will make our life easier it's e n here sum over m c n m phi m right so now this operator is also can penetrate the sum, and uh, then we'll use the condition that uh, functions uh, that we are working with are to are to normal, right? Then we will get e n sum over m c n m uh, Kronecker symbol. Here there is a k, the index for this function that we operate with, okay? And then the summation then will be restricted only to uh, the m, which is equal to k. Otherwise, well, the delta Kronecker is 0, right? So then the whole thing becomes c and k, only one term. Now, on the left-hand side, what we have is... Um, you probably won't see here, right? Can you see here? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, okay, cool. So then the left-hand side, uh, 
you can't see there. Okay, that's that's no fear. Uh, that's no problem uh, because we have so many boards here. Uh, right. So then, if we just work on the left hand side, uh, then we will get the integrals of. Um, Star x, h, acting on phi, n, x, right? This whole thing multiplied by c, uh, this should be m, this should be n, m, right? And there should be some over m, okay? And that's our left hand side, which is equal to the n. And a. Right? So this is usually called um, now matrix element of the Hamiltonian H K M. Right? It's a number because if our Hamiltonian presumably acts on the uh, x variable, right? And we integrate that x variable, so you get the number. And so what we then is a sum of these numbers k m multiplied by c n m uh, equals to e n c n k, right? And uh, this is a, this can be uh, transformed in the matrix form, where H is a matrix C. I'll put n as a superscript, so this n as a superscript, because really this n is fixed, right? So we we have this for any k uh, for one between one and uh, whatever number of our uh, basis functions is. So say m runs from one to big n. Right, so then k runs from 1 to n, and so then m goes between 1 and big N, k goes between 1 and big N, and so we have the matrix of the Hamiltonian multiplied by a, a vector uh, which consists of C n, say 1 till C n big N, right? This is equal to E n C again a vector, right? So this is eigenvalue problem in the matrix form. You can solve it and obtain the solutions for or approximations to the solution of uh, original time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, it's one of the simplest way where we assume that our uh, solutions are presentable in linear uh, as linear combinations of some basis functions yeah okay so as I was saying in the previous part that uh, Solving time independent Schrodinger equation is uh, well, crucial, essentially, yes. right? And I guess the part I didn't emphasize is that mm, for many cases, uh, this time independent Schrodinger equation is not exactly solvable. Yeah. Okay? So now, one way to solve this or reformulate it in a somewhat well, standard linear algebra problem is to represent the functions that you are looking for as linear, yeah, as linear combination of some known functions, okay? Known, known, yeah, known functions. So one example would be: imagine you have a particle in a box, right? So you know how to solve time independent Schrodinger equation, right? But now imagine someone would uh, well start. Uh, tempering with the bottom of that well and uh, create, say, the inclined bottom, right? So that would correspond to adding the potential, or the, the original potential was uh, 
v0, right, at 0 or infinity, depending on whether x is within the box or x is not within the box, right? Now, if we go from this to linear potential, which is alpha x for x within the box and the same infinity outside, right? So then, the um, natural thing to do would be, you know the particle in the box solution, you know the solution for the H0 problem, right? Then you just make a linear combination of them to get the solution of a, a new problem, right? And uh, that's the way to derive this, essentially by a reformulating problem in a matrix form, yeah. In, uh, in, in my course of going way back, mm -hmm. we would always sort of choose our known functions would that work here, but just make things more difficult for ourselves? We wrote our solution in terms of an infinite polynomial. Uh, you can write uh, things in uh, any basis set, essentially. You right? Can just, you can just pick a basis set. So right. So the idea here is that you're solving differential equation, right? So the uh, h is differential operator. And so it's acting on the function, you're getting the function back with times constant, right? So the only condition that uh, your basis uh, needs to satisfy, and uh, it never, I guess, satisfies in, the, in reality, is a completeness. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so if you are really looking for a true solution, then the true solution would come naturally if you have infinite number of functions that uh, form the complete set, right? Then with that you can describe any function of your choice, right? Yes. So now in reality, uh, if we are working in the, like uh, for the spatial variables, in reality we don't have complete, well like complete set would require infinite number of uh, functions, right? Because only infinite number of functions can describe any potential function here. Unless you have some restrictions that you know that the solution you're looking for uh, is a uh, well, some uh, is kind of um, satisfies some symmetry property, right? So, for example, one symmetry property that uh, we know will work for, well, say you have a now well, even for this problem, even before we go to the harmonic oscillator, say one of the symmetric constraints may be. If you make a perturbation that uh, well doesn't break the symmetry of the problem, but rather well makes life complicated, all right? So it is a symmetric kind of double well now with uh, infinite wa uh, infinite walls, right? So then, since the symmetry is still there, you would expect all the functions to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. Okay. Yeah, so now why is that? Uh, well, potential. Yeah, well, it seems plausible, right? But uh, why is that? That if the potential is, I guess, the, the mathematically strict uh, definition of what I'm trying to say is that the potential is symmetric. That means V of x uh, me is equal to V of minus x. Right, so if say we put the we put the origin somewhere in the center, right, uh, and then the typical particle in the box then will be from minus l and a half to l and a half, right, mm -hmm. and all our functions will be either symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to interchange of the sine of x variable, right. So then we modify the potential so that the potential is. Uh, uh, symmetric, right? Now the question becomes uh, why, why, for this modification we can expect that uh, our all our functions will be symmetric or anti-symmetric. So these unknown functions phi n uh, will be either like this, which is anti-symmetric, or they will be like this, symmetric.
That's right. So Hamiltonian has t plus v, right? So t has d over t squared dx squared, right? So then uh, switching x to minus x, uh, yeah, let's just generate back t, OK? And then potential is the same to the potential. Nothing changes, right? So um, but why? Why does this lead to this property? This is a good question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> there are a couple of steps here. Um, but yeah, and I don't expect uh, kind of the answer. I just want to focus your attention here is that uh, we studied in the past that if two operators commute, then they share a set of eigenfunctions, right? So one operator is a Hamiltonian, right? Because eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, that's what we're interested in, right? And another operator is an operator that acts like this. Uh, well, really it's a... It's the operator that takes the variable out of the function or operator x in this case, well, I, I let's, let me call it p. So this p operator, if you give it operator or function, right, then what p will do, it will substitute x to minus x. OK? So, so it's inversion operator or sine inversion operator. OK? So now h and p. they do commute for the reason that uh, it's easy to check that the way we check whether things are commute or not, it's, uh, it's better to put some function, right? Because commutator is an operator. It's acts on a function, right? So HP minus PH, right, acting on a function. So what do we get? Uh, well. Actually, h acts on function. We don't know what. We actually don't know the result, uh, and that's not important. Uh, but we know what p will be acting on h, and h is a function of x as well, right? So, what p will do, it will no do nothing to h, right? Because h is immune to the sign change. So h will stay the way it is. And then uh, function will change the sign inside. OK? And we don't know what, what this is. But that, that's not important. What is important, we compare this result with the result where we have h first, and then p, and then function, right? It's like this. So then result of this is h hasn't been touched by p. So h is still there. p, on the other hand, acts on f and makes f with minus x, right? So results of h acting on f and then p acting on the result of h f is the same as h acting on p times f, right? So that means the commutator is 0, right? So if we subtract 2, the result will be the same, OK? So on the other hand, if you had h that would not have a potential that is symmetric, right? Then this would be different. Uh, this would not hold. And like h minus x, if, it's, if it has a potential that, let's say, is anti-symmetric, then uh, this guy would have a minus sign, and minus minus will be plus, And so you would not have a zero commutator, right? In the case where. Uh, v of x, say, equals to minus V of minus x, right, in the Hamiltonian. In this case, you, the h and p would not commute. But in the symmetric bottom case, uh, h and p commute, and then that means they share the same eigenfunctions. Okay, you can find eigenfunctions, which will be the eigenfunction of both. So uh, what are the eigenfunctions of p? 
eigenfunctions, not the uh, eigenvalues. Uh, but you're on the right path is that eigenfunctions of P operator They must be something like uh, like this, right? Uh, and uh, we know what p does to a function. It uh, it produces f n minus x, right? And there are two possibilities. Either function is symmetric, or it is anti-symmetric. Okay, and more than that, any function, any function, you give me a function and I will make you a symmetric part. Uh, any function can be presented as a symmetric plus anti-symmetric part. That's very easy to do. You, you have a general function uh, where f of minus x is neither fx plus minus 1, right? So it's not like that, right? So function is neither symmetric or anti-symmetric. Then you still can present f of x as f symmetric of x plus f anti-symmetric of x, where symmetric part of x is uh, you just take a sum, divide by 2. Then you can check that this thing will be asymmetric, because this will switch to the minus, this will switch to the plus. And uh, since they are summed, no matter what they are, you still get them both with the same sign. Then the anti-symmetric part is just you take uh, f of x and minus f of minus x. And so then switching this to minus uh, and this one to plus will change the sign. So, okay. So any function can be represented as a linear combination of symmetric and anti-symmetric. Uh, the p operator has symmetric and anti-symmetric functions. And that's why, since the p operator should share eigenfunctions with h operator, they, uh, the h eigenfunctions will be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. Okay? And that's, uh, that's the result of the, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it's a result of um, some small result of a uh, symmetry topic uh, that we'll probably consider in the, at the end, closer to the end. Uh, but yeah, symmetry operations are useful because they <coughs> they constrain bases essentially. If we go back to our initial problem, right? So how to find eigenfunctions uh, of unknown operator? If we know that the bottom of that operator is symmetric, that means it commutes with the uh, sign change. That means all its functions are either symmetric or anti-symmetric, right? Then you would just do, instead of full search with the basis set that contains both symmetric and anti-symmetric, what, what you would do, you would do either basis that consists of symmetric functions or basis set that consists of anti-symmetric functions. Okay? And uh, symmetric, symmetric, and anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric, those are the blocks of the Hamiltonian matrix you have the blocks uh, which correspond to symmetric, anti-symmetric, or anti-symmetric, symmetric, they will be zero. So I know how much you know about solution of uh, matrix problem, like uh, eigenvalue problem. But it generally scales as n to the cube, right? So it's not a good scaling. Uh, so your system grows twice, and the computational price for that eight times, right? So it's usually what makes a time-independent problem difficult. Uh, there is another bigger problem, of course, uh, with, uh, with molecules and um, this particular ansatz. And it's related, again, to the, f the fact that, uh, OK, so if we have a Hamiltonian of two variables now, and imagine if we are smart and figured out, OK, so there is this small uh, operator h1 of x and h2 of y, right, for which we can either numerically or analytically find the, uh, 
Yeah, let's put one as a superscript to separate them. Uh, okay, we found the eigenfunctions for them. And this is then uh, lambda n for n x. And uh, let's say tildes for y. Right? But our Hamiltonian is, say, h1 plus h2 plus some so-called coupling term, right? which may be small, maybe not. So we want exact solution. Uh, the trouble is that if it's not for this part, then any product of one-dimensional problems, solutions, will be the uh, solution for the, oh, let's call this, H0 part, right? So H0 phi n x multiplied by phi m a y, that would be a, a perfectly valid solution with the sum of two eigenvalues. Somewhere we need tildes. Now with V, that's not true anymore. But since these guys are forming usually complete sets, one way to try to form the uh, psi x, y would be to get all possible linear combinations of phi n, x, phi m, y. Okay. Why all possible? Because uh, space of two variables, now we want to find uh, some general function, right? And to have a complete set in two variables, that means you need to have a set in one variable multiplied by a set of another, uh, with respect to another variable. So if we go to the finite uh, dimensions, uh, like this goes from 1 to some big n uh, for each of them. So then it goes up to the n square of the pairs, for the pairs, right? And that's the manifestation of inherent difficulty in quantum mechanics. And when we start adding particles, and they are all interacting through some kind of interaction, that could be a Coulomb interaction or some other interaction, then in order to apply this variational approach to find the coefficient, the matrices, the size of the matrices, grows uh, exponentially with the size of, uh, well, with the number of particles. Yeah. Now, is this the two-dimensional Schrodinger equation, or do we have two separate particles? Doesn't really matter. That's the nice part about quantum mechanics. You can think of one particle in two dimensions as two particles in one dimension. <laughs> if you think about it. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, really, there is no way to distinguish. Okay. Well, unless you start, well, there are some, like if you, if you, of course, you're talking about electrons and nuclei, they are real well, particles, right? So what we would do, we create uh, for each electron, each electron requires three variables. Uh, if we don't think about spin for now, right, x, y, z, <laughs> and technically, uh, yeah, probably, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, whether it will be needed. But even without, without spin, there are lots of, uh, essentially, this exponential scaling of matrix size, that's what I wanted to illustrate here. Because if, um, you, if you were dealing with, say, two basis functions per dimensions, right, that's a very poor choice, right? Then for the two particles, you would get, for, uh, well, for one dimension, it would be, one by one, uh, sorry, two by two, right? But for for two particles, that will be already four by four, right? And we'll keep increasing the Hamiltonian matrix, right? Because uh, you're trying to be complete, and uh, you cannot neglect uh, any products, uh, at least. Uh, just from the, the simple 
uh, consideration. Okay. Oh, of course, symmetry sometimes help, and you can again use symmetry like we we did in the case of uh, just a single variable and uh, a symmetric potential. Then you can half at least uh, this sum because for some eigenfunctions you would only need uh, symmetric uh, basis functions and for some you just need anti-symmetric right so you you would solve not say this is n uh, by half this is another n by half right so you would solve n, ha uh, n by half uh, n by half problem which is if the scaling is n cube that means it's n half q, right? So that gives you 1 8 times n cube. And so if you sum two problems like that, you still get uh, 1 fourth factor of speed up, right? Because of the symmetry. Because there are now two problems like this instead of one problem like that, right? So you still will benefit from symmetry. You can call this symmetrical decoupling of the problem, right? All right, so this is all nice. Uh, why did I uh, introduce this? Also for the reason that I want to talk uh, that operators, operators, they can be presented as uh, well, essentially maps between one function uh, or, well, yeah, well, essentially between the one function and the other function, right? So essentially what operator is, you give it a function, it will produce another function, right? And uh, eigenfunctions are the simplest functions in the sense that operator, when it acts on them, produce on the same function times constant, right? So that's why it is, you will see that it's so nice when you're working with operators to, to see, or to have the eigenfunctions, because then the action of the operator is very simple. Now, <laughs> you know that, uh, but on the other hand, operators are also can be represented as matrix, okay? So the connection between those two representations uh, is simply that uh, we can, in the Hilbert space, we can represent any function as a linear combination of the basis functions, okay? So... Say you want to act with h on a function psi of x, right? There are two choices, uh, naively, uh, if you think about this problem, and the h is just a, uh, depends on x, right? So first is just a, you, you can straightforwardly do that, right? And obtain, in general case, when psi is not an eigenfunction, some other function phi x, right? So h acts like a map. You, you gave it a function, it will produce another function. This is the first case. The second, more kind of elaborate choice is you know how h acts on uh, some basis functions, right? And uh, that means you know the matrix of h in that basis. And the matrix uh, well, corresponds to essentially to integrals of the functions h, some other function x. Generally, it, this uh, matrix is uh, non-diagonal. And then what you can do, you can express your function of x as linear combination of basis functions. Yes. And so what you're doing there is the inner product of two, like like a wave function and h, like in direct notation. That's right. That's where we're getting direct notation will be. So that's the matrix of the sorry that that h matrix is the coefficients. That's, that's right. Okay. So. Uh, you guys heard about Dirac notation, chemists, graduate students? Yeah, Dirac notation, okay. So that, that makes the whole thing easier. So then in Dirac notation, uh, our matrix is essentially phi n. This is just rewriting. Okay. 
And then. <coughs> and, and sorry, and that would be C and the C sub and M would be the answer to that inner product. Okay, so this uh, statement, right, is uh, well somewhat. Mm, well, you can we can also write this in Dirac notation, right? Mm -hmm. So psi equals two, and then here we'll have. Uh, uh, well, essentially, what we do here, we introduced uh, projection on the basis, right? Sum over, and this will be C ends, right? So, so we're decomposing our state vector, like our, our right. function, in terms of the eigen function. Not necessarily eigenfunctions. It can be any basis uh, functions. Okay. okay. Doesn't need to be uh, eigenfunctions. What I'm representing here, eigen, if if these guys are eigenfunctions, then this would be just diagonal matrix, right? And the uh, action an action of the Hamiltonian would be just easier to represent on them. But since we are talking in general. It just I can I can write off diagonal terms easily. I don't need to compute them. So, yeah. So it's not uh, it's not that I need to calculate this matrix. Uh, so I just write in the general basis functions. And uh, the main point here is that the Hamiltonian action on the function can be presented in two different ways. First, the Hamiltonian is acting on. Uh, we know the action of the Hamiltonian on some basis functions, and we also know how the uh, our function of interest is expressed in that basis. Okay. And, and that, that crossing out of the bottom—that's not like Cartesian. Like, well, what is that? Oh, that crossing kind of confused you last time as well, yeah. right? So that crossing, uh, that crossing is just. Uh, Guess separation of. Uh, is it just a, a product of a traditional multiplication? No, no, no. There is no, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a traditional multiplication. It's just this guy is uh, what bra, and this one is cat vector. Oh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got it. So yeah, the yeah, the yeah. nice thing about this uh, bra cat notation is that it's kind of even faster to write, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. I just yeah 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 no. Yeah. I'm so. Right. So now, in order to uh, and the, the Dirac notation actually helps to connect these two uh, views on the action of the Hamiltonian by uh, saying, okay, so if they have a Hamiltonian and we have a function psi, right? Then what happens is that we can introduce here so-called resolution of identity, and that would be the our basis presentation, right? And then what we will have is if we introduce this as identity operator uh, because it's an orthonormal basis, then it will make H act on the phi ends and then whatever this uh, result of this action is, we multiply it by the products of this uh, of the coefficients essentially the coefficients are the scalar products between the basis functions and our original function okay so what is like essentially this is an action of h on psi directly this is an action of h on basis function and then representation of our function as a, some kind of expansion in the basis Okay, and they are completely equivalent, uh, right? So <laughs> this is what Dirac notation allows us to have. Now, also, it uh, connects with uh, uh, with the continuous basis. Uh, the, the continuous basis is a basis for the coordinate representation. So, still, in order to connect this. Uh, phi of x with the Dirac notation, we can introduce the so-called continuous basis, and that's uh, x and p states. 
and they are eigenstates of x operator and the p operator. So what are they useful for? Now say if you consider some scalar product like this, right? Then there are several ways you can represent this. Uh, first, in the coordinate representation, the typical representation is uh, that we have this and then this function, right? And we integrate. And why is this really equal to that? Well, the reason is that we can introduce the complete basis set of these functions in between right and uh, generally when you introduce the well when we did this for the fine uh, for the discrete basis functions we have a uh, we have a summation over them right so here the basis set is continuous, so there is infinite number of them, and uh, they are enumerated by continuous index rather than discrete index, right? So that's why it's uh, presented by integral instead of the summation, okay? So now what this is is just essentially a repetition of this that's in continuous basis. And then that allows us to identify this quantity with this and this quantity with that, right? So we now have a coordinate representation as a projection on these basis functions. Uh, right now they may look a little bit weird and well, kind of inconvenient, but uh, actually they connect two representations. The, the representations we usually use, the uh, functions as uh, functions of variable of the continuous variables and this Dirac notation where we actually do not present uh, this object for example right this object has no X representation it's just an abstract object that can be represented in any space of any function so here we use discrete basis these are the states and these are the coefficients okay so we represented this state as as linear combination of a basis functions with these coefficients. Now, alternatively, we can represent the same function as uh, by putting the different resolution of identity here as, uh, say, now with x, that would be d of x okay, where or with P, and these guys are coordinate representations of the functions. So, so is this kind of like, well, when we're thinking of vectors as arrows, like the initial naive definition of a vector, mm -hmm. that arrow is physically what it is, yeah. kind of like a force or whatever. Uh -huh. And then I can pick my, my basis, I can put my basis over here and give the actual vector a representation of my basis. But, but my basis doesn't really mean anything. Like you can write it in any number of That's systems. Right. And so the state is physically there. Like the particle is physically in that state. Yeah. And then we can write that in the position basis or the momentum basis or whatever. That's right. That's, and that's what we're saying here? That's right. Right. So okay. uh, this, this is, yes, this is related to the introduction of... Uh, state as a as an abstract quantity right as you said with a vector so when we have when we operate with the vectors say i say well my vector is 5 1 right? that's just the vector in some basis in some, some basis exactly yeah. that's the problem with this representation right yeah okay. this is a problem with this representation 5 and 1 5 what and 1 what uh, like what what are the like presumably it's I assume that there is some x and y coordinate vectors, and they can look like this, 
uh, this would be x and this would be y, or well, they can look like that, right? Or I can switch them, right? So depending on the way x and y are defined, these numbers mean different things, right? Okay. So the state is also this psi in the cat form, right? It's an abstract vector without particular representation. But it already contains all the information. Now, in order to uh, produce a particular representation of that vector or that state in the Hilbert space, you project it on some representation. And right? in order to do that, that's why you use the cat bra if we wanted in the x basis of xx. That's right. And if we, if we wanted in the momentum basis, we would use cat bra with momentum. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then the same equation can be written, this uh, scalar product or dot product of two vectors. It actually doesn't require you to have any representation because this is a vector and this is a vector. And independent of the basis, uh, you have this as a number, right? So the number will be exactly the same. doesn't matter whether you integrate the space representations of those vectors or alternatively, uh, there is a way to present this as a second form would be to introduce the p notation and uh, have now psi p, p phi, okay? And also uh, the old representation that we use is a discrete representation. So if you have sum over basis, right? So then what it will correspond to is your basis functions, um, right? For anything, that's uh, those are just orthogonal basis. That's that's your basis to represent the states uh, in the Hilbert space, right? Okay. So any vector on this board can be represented in this with this basis x y or it can be represented by this basis. As long as they are orthonormal, then I can, I can use any of these representations to present. If they are not orthonormal, uh, then I am, well, not orthogonal, then I'm in trouble because, say, uh, two vectors are collinear, right? It won't be enough to represent any vector on this board. It will be enough to represent only vectors along this line, but if, I, if I'm interested in a vector that uh, is off that line, then the coordinate along this x and y will, can be, will be kind of redundant and we'll lose this part. So they don't have to be orthogonal, they can be collinear. They can, they, yeah, they, they should be linearly independent, right? Yes, 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 yes. But, but they are orthogonal. They're, if they are orthogonal, then you can normalize them always, usually, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and uh, you can use them to present uh, your states, okay? Now, <coughs> what else do we want to know about this? Uh, uh, now, it all may sound like uh, you can represent anything in in any basis, right? So what is the most preferable basis to representation? Uh, well, it depends on the problem. Uh, but uh, and I'll illustrate that point more uh, in future lectures. Uh, one well, kind of thing you may wonder about is uh, what would be, say, quantities like that, right? And uh, because these guys, x, for example, or p that uh, we introduce, they are eigenfunctions of uh, x operator, and they produce x, right? So what is their coordinate representation? OK? So that would be something like this. Or what is their momentum representation? So how do, how do we think about these quantities? You have the operator, the x operator, uh -huh. times the x eigenvector, and then you have x as right. eigenvalue. Is there, I'm just confused as to why we know that x. 
Well, the X is an operator, right? And this is a state that is an well, eigenfunction. So calling its, its eigenvalues X. Yes. It oh, must okay. produce the, it's, I guess, the ultimate uh, eigenfunctions for the X operator, right? So if we claim in the quantum mechanics that every operator has a set of eigenfunctions, and when we measure object, then we collapse in the function to the eigenfunctions, yes. right? And we are getting eigenvalues. So those are the guys that are uh, eigenfunctions of the X operator. So, okay. okay? And correspondingly for P, it's the same, right? So now, these guys, uh, they are so-called uh, delta functions, uh, which are delta functions, uh, not the, don't confuse that with delta Kronecker, but rather they are mm, Dirac delta, yes. Dirac kind of introduced the, those quantities and that con this continuous basis sets uh, to connect two representations, essentially connect the representation where we work with functions as uh, in the coordinate or P representation, right? And uh, when we work with functions as uh, essentially one way to see the functions in this infinite but discrete basis is just a set of coefficients, right? So any function, if you know the basis, any function is just a set of these coefficients which are uh, scalar product of the basis with, uh, with our functions, okay? In that sense, operators, one way to think about operators is operators are functions in an infinite dimensional space because what they do, they modify these coefficients. That's all they do. If you think about it, you have a function, operator acts on it, you get another function. But this function and that function, they're all expressible in uh, as a linear combination of some basis, right? So you fix the basis, and for psi you get c n times phi n. For the, well, for this function as a result, that can be sum over d n, and then I use phi n, and that's a different phi, right? So, so then this function is pretty much the set of this coefficients, and this function is a set of this coefficients, right? So what operator H did, it took this as variables and return you this. That's one uh, alternative way to look at the operators. It's just a function in an infinite dimensional space. All right, if you adopt this basis set uh, kind of view, then that's, that's what it is. And uh, why these guys are like that, and let me just finish that this is, uh, this is relatively simple. It's a plane wave, and that can be obtained just because uh, going from X to P basis, you need to do Fourier transformation, right? But why, say, this is a delta function, why does it make sense? Uh, one way to see this is to consider this. This is, by definition, is, uh, well, this is Psi of X. It's represented like this, right? And then if we again introduce the resolution of identity over DX prime, then we'll have x, x prime, x prime, psi, right? Uh, then what we have here is that this, again, pretty much the same as, as, as we started with, but it's now the function of x prime variable, not the x variable, right? And we have this quantity. So we have integral over dx prime over the whole space x, x prime, acting on the psi of x prime, right? And at the end, we're getting the result psi of x. So then the question is what this is. But we know from the definition of Dirac delta, Dirac delta is one way to define it. It's this, um, well, from the idea that this function, what it must do, if you integrate with any function, it will give you this function at the point of x0. Right? So that's one of the definitions of delta function. Okay? Uh, yeah? I mean, one thing that I was thinking, like, the way you have that eigenvalue, eigenvector problem there, uh -huh. or eigenfunction, I was thinking, 
So what, when it collapses, when you collapse the wave function, when you do a measurement, yeah. you, you have to collapse it to one of the eigenfunctions. Mm -hmm. So if you know where it is, I mean, it has to be very narrow. Very That's interesting. right. Is, is that a, an appropriate line of logic for a question like that? Or yeah, yeah. Like, okay. That's right. So it must be infinitely narrow, but the trouble is that then uh, it, it to for <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's not going to be normalizable. That's one trouble with that. Uh, but for this type of uh, condition, right? If you think about it, you have a function of, of x, right? And uh, you want to get as an integral a single value of that function. So you must emphasize this point, this, this particular point, very strongly. right? The trouble with that is that whenever like one approach would be to put the Gaussian, for example, right here. And Gaussian, of course, if you multiply uh, Gaussian by function of x, right, it will emphasize all these values. Right, and then essentially we'll remove from the picture all that, all, all the all the other values, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then the trouble is that the base of the Gaussian uh, will be smaller and smaller and smaller. If you keep the Gaussian finite, you will get the uh, well, the integral diminishingly small, right? Now, for keeping the integral finite, and that's that's the value finite then this Gaussian must grow in uh, height indefinitely because the, the base of that Gaussian becomes